Hello, this is Rocker World again. We just took a look at in episode uh, 97, we took a look at Revelation 21 to 6, and uh, it's the seventh day, uh, the Sabbath day, which is the thousand year reign. That's the picture of the Sabbath day, and it's uh, uh, point you straight to the message that Yeshua brought to us. He preached the kingdom. It was the good news, the hope of the kingdom. And he was referring to the thousand years where we get rid of Satan. We don't have to deal with his, his deception, his harassment. And people will live using God's rules and regulations. They will live with his teaching and instruction. That's what the Torah means. And it will be an awesome world. It will be uh, a perfect world. And then you got to wonder. And now it's episode 98. Why would the Lord turn Satan loose again at the end of the thousand years? Uh, before I try to answer that question, Remember, we're looking through a dark, a glass darkly, but it becomes clearer with time, and we're getting closer and closer to the place we will see it all quite clearly and quite perfectly. This is the time of the restitution of all things. So, uh, before we tackle that, I want to just mention from episode 97 uh, when you read Revelation 21 6, it talks about the first resurrection. And I had mentioned that the bride would be reigning and ruling with, with uh, Yeshua, our salvation. He's the captain of the army. He is returning as a warrior. And uh, we have just defeated the evil army. And the thousand years has begun. And we reign Hopefully, we includes me and you and the ones ahead that will listen to this and listen to the others that are preaching and teaching the spirit of Elijah, the message of Elijah, to cross the line from Baal worship into the worship of the true God. So I want to talk a little bit about the concept of the first fruits. Uh, this first resurrection in, includes not only the bride, the 144,000 that have worked with supernatural powers given to them by God during this 50-year tribulation, but it includes the second army, at which are the tribulation saints, and we have seen them talked about in a few, few different places, not only in Revelation, but uh, we see them in uh, other ways, I'm thinking of uh, Eddie Chumney's book, uh, Who is the Bride of Christ? And he talked about the division between the, the Holy of Holy believers, the inner court believers, and the outer court believers. And Rick Joyner, the vision that the Lord gave to him, I'm not sure Rick understood his own vision. I kind of think he didn't uh, in its fullness for sure. He saw the 144,000, and, and they were the first army. And they're also the, the ones we see in the book of Joel that move in order, perfectly following the instructions they receive intuitively from their leader, who is Yeshua, the captain of the army, the warrior that leads the army that defeats the evil force. So back to this first resurrection. Uh, the first resurrection, and again, I'm, I'm speaking speculatively. This is what I see uh, a little uh, more not as clear as we will see in the future. This, this first resurrection uh, comes to the, a concept of the first fruits. The first fruits... The first one of the first fruits was Jesus Christ, whose proper name is Yeshua, our salvation. 
He rose on the Feast of First Fruits. After that Passover, way back 2,000 years ago, he died on the Passover. He was the Passover lamb. He went in the grave on the days of unleavened bread. He removed sin from our lives. That's what the day. That's what uh, the days of unleavened bread picture is: removal of sin. And then he rose on the third day, as he predicted, uh, just as the prophet uh, Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. He rose on the third day, and that was the Feast of First Fruits. And I've gone through all these, how it all fit together. So go back in the episodes and take a closer look. And when he rose that day, he was the first of the First Fruits. Now, he trained 12 people, his disciples. They became uh, the next of the first fruits when they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And uh, we're, then we're referring to the first Feast of Weeks, which is was misnamed Pentecost. Uh, the count of seven weeks later. Uh, and in that period of time, there was about 120 believers. So the, the Holy Spirit was already working uh, to a small degree. And then uh, on, on the Feast of First Fruits, the Holy Spirit was poured out in a mighty way for the first time. And 3,000 people in one sermon, that was a good sermon, right? Uh, became filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Those were two gifts that God used as a witness to other people that something miraculous had happened. And thus, in the space of a count of seven weeks, we've gone from one first fruit, Yeshua, our older brother, our suffering servant, and our warrior, leader, king, we went from that one first fruit to 3,121, if I got my math right. And then in the years since, that has constantly increased. And as these people die, I'm, I'm, I'm speculating that they are amongst the cloud, great cloud of witnesses that watch from paradise. They're, according to Rick Joyner's vision, they're able to watch everything that's going on on this earth. They're watching you. They're watching me do these YouTubes. Hopefully the Holy Spirit is putting words in my brain and my mouth as I open my mouth. Uh, that there's a minimum of errors being spoken. And uh, that all these 2,000 years since that number has been increasing. And of course, there were, there were first fruits uh, prepared before that time. And, and when Yeshua died, all the believers up to that point were led to paradise. Uh, anyway, I get my my story too expanded here and lose myself. Um, so what I'm saying is the, these first fruits began to be collected, and it was uh, sort of like a trickle at first. Although that that first uh, feast of weeks there was that was a pretty good day to have three thousand added. Uh, but in the years since, there have been more and more. There have been millions upon millions. And then uh, as they die, they, they join that great cloud of witnesses. And now in these last days, we have, we're looking forward to the greatest harvest by far that has ever been. And I've been, I've been speculating that we're going to look at several billion people being brought into the kingdom of God during the tribulation. At any rate, where I'm going with all this is this collective group of people, and we're getting up to the a few billion now, right? Uh, they are the first fruits, and uh, there's more than just the bride here. Remember when Yeshua returned, that uh, the dead in Christ were raised first from the dead. And they were given, they're given physical bodies, and then together with the bride who has navigated the 50 years through supernatural help and powers, they rise with 
them and they all together they rise and meet the Lord in the air and they're ever with the Lord. And then we get to the thousand years where they all reign together. And what I want to throw in here that uh, amongst this, I'm going to say there's a few billion people here. There's the bride, which is the first army. There's uh, the foolish virgins I've suggested. The I think it was the church of, of uh, oh my, uh, Sardis that woke up at the last moment when Yeshua returned as a thief in the night. The tribulation saints, they are the second army. And then there's the vast number of believers that uh, didn't do so well. They refused to embrace the fullness of what God is is doing and has done. And uh, but they also are part of this group. And it, I, I had this idea. There's sort of like the 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 group that received the the gold prize. That's the bride. The silver. Uh, were the second army and then this vast group that did quite poorly and basically have no more than their salvation for eternity that's their reward but they are amongst the first fruits they're like the bronze prize in our Olympic categories anyway these are just some ideas and uh, my intent and my hope my objective is to give hope to people that as well as or poorly as we do in our in our walk we still have a reward and the Lord is pleased with us he would just he just he does desire that we do the very best that we uh, we strive for the best prize the highest prize and Paul talked about that and uh, he was comparing it to kind of like Olympic Games and and the such. So I better get to my topic here. Uh, why would the Lord let Satan go? Why was he put in a prison for a thousand years? And why was why is he let go at the end of the thousand years? So I've had 42 years to think about this. Remember, in my journey, uh, I'm going to say the very first year I walked with the Lord, I... I pulled that Bible out and uh, I started reading. And when I got the book of Revelation, I I thought, this is really cool. But remember, I'm a 20-year-old. My my wife, who first time she was introduced to Revelation was eight years old, and she found it pretty scary. And so did our children, who were introduced to it even younger than eight, as they all participated uh, with us, mom and dad. We all went to the Worldwide Church of God and we we uh, taught lots of stuff. We talk about the, talked about the last days. We thought we were the 144,000. We were mistaken. Uh, hopefully there's a few amongst us that, uh, that make that grade, that make the gold, and uh, even a few more that make the silver and a whole bunch, hopefully, that make the the bronze and that there's no none lost that's our hope so anyway uh, in reading this for 42 years I lots of times I've probably read the book of Revelation more than any other single uh, piece of, of the what we what Christians call the Bible I, I'll call it part of the inspired commentary and I think it eventually it will be uh, put into the category of the prophets it's the capstone of the prophets, ties all the prophets together, all the different prophecies and bits and pieces that kind of seem jumbled together like marbled, uh, uh, marbled cheese, kind of all jumbled together. And the Lord requires that we study, that we be workmen uh, that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of God. And you get to that point by, with effort, you can't just read it once or just twice or three or four or whatever you have to read it quite a number of times and then you have to study you have to pull things apart put it together you have to meditate you got to pray you got to study you got to you know all these things they do take time but 
uh, to give some encouragement, this will be sped up in these last days. You will learn very, very quickly. But uh, it's always best to start right away. Now, where was I? Why would say? Why would God really say? Well, as I went through these forty-two years, of course, every time I read it, I go to this, get to this part, and I'm thinking, why? What would be the purpose of this? And I, you know, I know there's a purpose. I just don't know what it is. So, you know, I'm. In, in a very strong sense, every time I get this part, I'm I'm saying, Lord, what does this mean? And that's really the question for all of Scripture. Uh, when you see something, you just have no clue what it is. the The question is, what does this mean? Whether you speak it or not, you want to know. And uh, so, anyway, one of the ideas that came to me as time progressed, was that it was a second witness. The Lord always uses a second witness for things. That uh, one isn't good enough. He he goes above and beyond in everything he does. In a court of law, there needs to be a second witness. You can't convict someone uh, that uh, on, on the testimony of one witness. And, of course, they have to be reliable witnesses. The Lord requires that there be two reliable witnesses. So, uh, it, what, it's not just good enough for Satan to deceive the world once. He needs to do it twice to, to uh, get the point across as loud and clear as would be ever possible that when we walk outside the boundaries of the Torah, the boundaries of the Lord's instructions and teachings, we run amok and we are faced with eternal death. Now, God being patient, long-suffering, and very merciful, he gives us human beings in our physical form more than one chance. And uh, a lot of teachers uh, don't like that idea. They, it seems, uh, seems to me a lot of people want to send everybody to hell, but I want to, I want to save them all from eternal death. That's my desire, and I see the Lord saying, I'm not willing that any be lost. So that's what I'm going with, and I see lots of things and lots of ways the Lord accomplishes this. So anyway, uh, if we back this whole story up, we've come to the end of, of man's rule. Satan is defeated, the false prophet, the beast, the, um, all the evil components of, uh, of this army is defeated, and Satan is locked away along with the false prophet and the beast all locked away for a thousand years and uh, what happens then is the the kingdom is here okay the kingdom that Jesus talked about it's here we do everything God's ways for a thousand years my speculation is that people will not die during this thousand years it'll be like it was when Adam and Eve were created they live a long long time and they almost in those days, they almost made it to a thousand years. They just came short. But I'm proposing that in the thousand year reign, people will not die. So everybody that is born during this time will li be living when Satan's released. And let's propose that there'll be a several billion people by the time the thousand years are over. And then, but none of them have ever experienced the deception of Satan. They can read about it, they can hear about it, they can listen to all our testimonies for a thousand years, they'll be fascinated, they'll embrace it, they'll they'll just, you'd think they'd have it down in their spirits, just so down pat. And behold, Satan's released, and in a very, very short time, whether that's weeks, months, or a few short years, Satan deceives the whole world again, a second time. As incredulous as that seems, that shows very clearly the power of the deception of Satan and devil and how wary we have to be of him and his ability to deceive. And as the Lord said, if it were possible, he would deceive even the elect. So obviously the elect at this point in time, this group of people he calls his elect, have a supernatural protection put on their hearts and minds. We, and I'm hoping I'm one of them, but uh, we, uh, I hope includes all of you listening, that 
uh, without that supernatural help and protection, we would be deceived also. So here we are at, let's move it ahead now to the end of the thousand years and virtually everyone. And I'm going to say there's a few that resist, but uh, just like there is today, just a few, just a remnant. God always calls it the remnant, the tiny bit like the hair that Ezekiel was asked to pull out of the out of the the third that was left he this tiny little bit the remnant and uh, then Satan is uh, at, after this second rebellion the he gets to work a short work virtually everyone rebels and of course they're all deceived again this is deception this isn't uh, it's not a fair judgment to send them all to hell because they were deceived. Just like in our world today, people that are deceived are deceived. They're not willingly going along with this. Uh, they have made choices that they're responsible for, but uh, the Lord is going to bring a judgment, and we'll get to that on, on the next step, the next episode. And I'm going to do my best to show you that... Uh, it's not just a judgment where you uh, stand in front of the court and you're uh, either the trap door opens and sends you down to hell or or you uh, take a step to the to the right and go to heaven that's not how the judgment works in in my estimation so um, i think i'll call that a wrap why was satan why will satan be lo loose that for that short time what is the purpose of it and then we will never see or hear from satan ever ever again for all of eternity he and the fallen angels their judgment is eternal they will never be seen from again that's the end of this story at to this point see you soon rock our world